Heidi Baker's story stretches across four continents over the course of 20 years. It's taken her from the Ivy League to Mozambique and practically everywhere in between. Why did she take this journey? It's because she was compelled by love. Take a look. God is looking for friends. Heidi's life is infectious. It's, it's an ongoing experience with different nuances every single day. Anyone, anyone that discovers who he is would give everything. He's, he's the pearl of great price. He's the lover of our souls. He's beauty itself. Africa shall be saved in the name of Jesus from Cape Town to Cairo. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Will you fulfill your destiny by laying down? You stand up by becoming nothing. You become him. Well, Heidi Baker is with us now, and Heidi, it's a joy to have you. Welcome you. back. I thought I knew you, and I'm watching this movie, and I'm going, I didn't know that. Your first communion, you fell out. Uh, I, imagine, I imagine that was an unusual experience for that church. Did they, they had never did they seen know, it before. <laughs> did they know what was happening? Did you know what was happening? Oh, no. I'd never heard of anything like that. It was an Episcopalian church in, in San Clemente. And I remember Father Green saying, sometimes this happens. She just fainted. She was overwhelmed. <laughs> and uh, God just knocked me out in the spirit. How old were you? I was 12. You were 12. And I wasn't even born again yet. So how that works theologically, I don't know. But I know. <laughs> I will pour out my spirit on all, all flesh. flesh. Yeah. All flesh. And I took communion and bam, fell out in the spirit. Um, and... That, what did that create in you? Just a great hunger. I, I don't understand it, but I've had this de desperate desire for God even before I knew him. I just wanted to be with him, and I would sing to him before I knew Jesus personally. I would sing to, to God. I would worship him. I would sing, sing out and just love on him. Well, that, uh, that's just hard to, for, for, I think, for most people to really comprehend that kind of, uh, th literally throughout your life, mm -hmm. you were spiritually aware and had that hunger and were, were looking in, in, in a life of dedication, that yeah. that was your singular pursuit, that was you. Yes, it was. <laughs> it might have to do with the fact my parents, who were also not born again, mm -hmm. uh, my father's family were Jewish. They became Catholic. Then he became an agnostic at Stanford. And so they, they were just all in a different realm. They dedicated me to Jesus. They said, Jesus, you can take her because my brother just died. And I was six weeks in the hospital at mm -hmm. St. Joseph's with meningitis. And they said, if you would just keep her alive, you can have her. And uh, later I led both wow. my parents to Jesus and they were powerfully born again and filled with the spirit about 20 some years after that. So you're a Samuel. <laughs> yes. You were, you were dedicated. I was. Even and though God they didn't know what that. they were doing. God honors that. Right. Yeah. yeah I, I believe in dedicating your children. I think it's. I do too. I think it's a covenant that God loves to honor. Yeah. You do unusual things. You go on mission <laughs> trips with no money. You, God tells you in the morning you're supposed to get on an airplane, and that afternoon you're on that airplane with, yeah. with no money. Well, What's, that was uh, in my teenage years. Now, you don't do that anymore? Now I just get on planes <laughs> mercifully. Mercifully, I have, a, I have a ticket, but I do pray for good seats. <laughs> <laughs> you pray for leg room? I pray for leg room, yeah. But I, no, I started off... Um, and I just would hit wherever God would tell me to go. I was at university and so I wouldn't have a, a lot of extra funds. And I would just hear God say, go to England, go to Mexico, go wherever. I just go to the airport. I would just wait and pray. 
Sometimes God would send prophets to the airport and they'd say, oh, hi, Heidi. Um, we, God told us you'd be here. And uh, people would walk up in, in the line and hand me money. And the Lord told me not to tell people what I needed. Um, so I would just be waiting. And I, there's never a trip God told me to go on I didn't get on a plane. Do you view that as sort of a training period? Absolutely, yeah. yeah that that if, you, if you can really believe and, and, and trust in what may look like to you today a small thing. At the time, it was huge. It was huge. Um, but it may look like a small thing. But is it just getting you prepared for the bigger? Absolutely. Like back then, preparing, just believing God for daily bread for me, and then believing God for daily bread for our family of four. Now believing God for daily bread for 20,000 people. It's all the same thing because it's God who provides it. And it's you just living in that secret place. And it's like, okay, Jesus, just take care of me. I can't do it myself. I can't provide it mm. myself. Um, I know we work, of course we all work, right. but we live we in do a the supernatural, possible. right. We do the possible yeah. and, and I like to pray, okay, I've done that. Now God, it's your turn. <laughs> it's your turn, that's why. <laughs> and, it, and you do the impossible. And he makes bread for us. He multiplies food. He sends trucks. He sent a freighter ship one time, a whole freighter ship full of food. So you just live in that realm and God just moves in a way we can't understand. Just. Yeah. A, the God, Holy Spirit breathed away. Now, I like to remind people around here, the only thing that's changed is the zeros. Right, it's true, <laughs> it's true. And it's, and it's all the same, we're still, we still need to be in attitude, we're in total dependence on Him. Yeah, what and never What we're proposing to do is impossible. Mm -hmm. So God can do that. Yeah. And how big is that? How big is that possible? And we can't grow, we can't just grow up and say, well, now I have it, now I'm good. We have to grow down and stay childlike. We have to stay like that child that just trusts daddy every day, trusts daddy. It doesn't matter if it's one or, or 100,000 people that you're feeding or mm. whatever you're doing, it's trusting daddy God, positioning yourself for the miracle, positioning yourself to move in the supernatural. We have to live well, like what that. What was your breakthrough where, you know, I, you can have, what I'll call financial miracles, miracles of provision, miracles of multiplication. Mm -hmm. But it, it seems like once you get comfortable with a particular manifestation of the miraculous, you, you want to stay there. You've broken out to, okay, God, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 was the, what was the breakthrough? Um, the first time that I ever saw food multiply was a big breakthrough, huge breakthrough. Um, I was in Mozambique, where I still live today. We've been there almost 20 years now, living in Mozambique. And the, the government had just taken all our buildings and we had 320 kids. About 100 of them had walked uh, 27 kilometers to our little office and we had no food. And I was exhausted. I didn't feel full of God. I just felt exhausted. I was pretty much angry, mm -hmm. um, felt like screaming. Uh, I hadn't slept in days, hadn't eaten in days. My two toehead blonde kids were hungry. It was just like crazy. And I was not a happy person. And all these children were there and I'm like, I just felt like saying, go away. Of course I didn't say that, but I wanted to. Just go away, we don't have any food. I we don't have any buildings. I wanted to go away. <laughs> and I could get on a plane, you know? I could stand in line and believe for a ticket and get on a plane. At that time, I even had a credit card. See, I could have whipped you that out. Have. But what I did was I just, I just cried out to God. And this lady called me from the U.S. Embassy. Her name was Nelda. She said, I made food for you. She was <laughs> really Southern, made food for you. And I thought, thank you, come on over. It was chili and rice. It was for our family of four. It was a generous portion, would have fed eight. And, and she looked at me and I said, um, Nelda, I have a lot of children. And she, she was more upset than me. She said, I don't want you to show me those kids. You just stop that. You know how much food there is, stop it. I said, no, you just pray right now. And I opened the door and I did not give her what she wanted. I made her look at those kids. I said, here are the, my children. They're right here and they're hungry. And I said, let's just pray over this food. And Nelda was so ticked. She was ticked at me. God bless it, amen. And I was there with my older adopted kids. We started serving 
in these plastic plates we had for street outreach, and every single child ate a big portion, like a Mozambican, how they want to eat, a lot of rice with the caril, the sauce on top. Mm -hmm. Everybody ate, and then Nelda, I said, Nelda, would you like some food? And she cried, she bawled like a baby. And that's when things shifted for me, because mm -hmm. God can make food. And uh, another time was during the floods when we, we were feeding maybe 5,000 a day, then 10,000 a day, then 15,000 a day. And I was in my office just praying and, and a guy called, I didn't know, and said, are you Heidi Baker? And I said, yes. He said, well, I have a freighter ship full of food for you. That blew my mind, mm. a freighter ship. And then God sent the people with a warehouse when I was on the street ministering, I always liked to minister in the street in the bush. And he came and they gave me keys to a warehouse. So you have a freighter ship full of food, you need big warehouses. God just did it like that. So I have belief for any amount of food. What would you tell somebody watching right now who maybe they were dedicated and they, they may be right now saying, can I, can I really trust and can I trust God with everything? Because the, the pull, I think, in Western cultures is, you know, be sensible, have a career, you know, live, live the, I guess, the safe track, if you will. What, what would you tell them? I say just throw yourself at Jesus' feet. You know, lose your life and you'll find it. And, and if God has a career for you, see, it, it all happens at his feet. It, why is it either or? It, it might be a career. You may be called to be a famous surgeon. You may be called to be a prima ballerina. But throw your life at his feet. Give yourself to him. Cling to him. You know, just love on him. He has a plan for you life that's way better than your own plan for your life. So instead of being, oh, well, I'm going to die, die, die. We die daily. But as we lay down, we find out who we are mm -hmm. in the presence. So just give yourself away. That's how life's multiplied. And it's part of the gospel. Yeah. For God so loved the world that he gave. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we're compelled by love, we'll do the same thing. We'll give. We'll yes. give ourselves away. It's great being with you. Um, we can talk for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and probably will after this program. Uh, the documentary is called Compelled by Love. You can find out how you can watch it. All you have to do is go to CBN.com and we'll show you how you, you can be part of it.